Welcome to part 10 of Crash Course Cryptography. My name is Julian and today we are talking about the discipline at the very top. It's the pinnacle that we kind of worked towards in those past nine episodes. We are talking about the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So we're going to be talking about how to sign using elliptic curves. And I'm telling you already, this is going to be quite some heavy stuff. And the only way how we can push this through in less than half an hour is by building on top of a lot of things that we covered in those first episodes. So if you don't have some basic understanding of cryptography, you need to watch those first nine episodes. Otherwise, you're going to be confused out of your pants today. This is going to be very important. We're going to go into some math. It's not difficult math, but there's going to be some math. And that's important because we need to understand some of the formulas that go in. But we are basing a lot of the knowledge on how encryption decryption in elliptic curve actually works and how cyclic group works and some of the examples. And uh, this, I think, is quite relevant and quite important to understand. So as an intro, and we're not going to dive right into the writing pad because we first need to understand some basic ideas. When we are trying to do signing, so in this case, we're talking about a digital signature algorithm using elliptic curves, we're talking about making a signature. And a signature on a regular document is quite straightforward. I have a paper and then I sign. And obviously, forging would be possible um, by great forges and there's great movies. Um, Catch me if you can, for example, where all this stuff got faked. But as soon as we talk about the digital stuff, this gets way harder. Because in the digital world, changing something is quite easy. So we need to have a signature that has some very special functions. We need to have some ideas in how the signature can can kind of do its job individually, depending on what we're trying to sign. Because otherwise, I just copy paste one signature from here to the next part. Remember, a digital signature is not that I scan it, it means that I can sign digitally somehow. And if there's just a number of letters, for example, well, I just take the number of letters and copy to the next document. So the trick on doing digital signatures is by the signature adapting automatically to what we're trying to sign. And this is some really exciting stuff because this means that your signature changes digitally every single time as soon as you try to sign something differently. And that's quite cool. And that's how basic cryptography actually works the other direction. Now remember, this actually is something we discussed in one of the very early episodes where we discussed that, yes, you can use the public key to encrypt something and then the private key to decrypt, but you can also use your private key to sign for something and then have the public key to prove or to verify that you actually signed. So let's go into the writing pad now and discuss four key things that we actually need for us to be able to do such digital signing. So let's talk about part 10, elliptic curve digital signing algorithm. Great. Now we have those four key things that we need, four keys for uh, signing functions. And we're gonna be discussing those. And the key thing, and then you will understand straight away. So here we have symmetric and here we're gonna have asymmetric. So we're going to write this down because it's going to be interesting to see if we actually have this. So the first thing we need is confidentiality. And that's very straightforward. By me signing something, I don't want to reveal my private key. I think that's quite straight um, forward. Uh, The second thing is authenticity. Um, Authenticity means that the private key must have signed the message. It couldn't have been done through something else. And so far, both these would be working with symmetric and asymmetric um, algorithm. I could sign a message with a symmetric key um, and it could be very clear, um, very easy. It's actually something that would be possible. Um, I'm telling you why point four is not working, but let's talk about this. Um, Integrity. Integrity means the process I'm using makes it clear that nothing was fiddled around with. And this is important for the entire algorithm. So we always need to have confidentiality. It's going to be very interesting, especially when we talk about the elliptic curve, uh, digital signature algorithm, Uh, authenticity, integrity. And the fourth one, and that's the most important one, is ownership. Because 
ownership only exists in asymmetric cryptography. In symmetric cryptography, both, because the key is the same, the signer and the decryptor, both people, could uh, the signer and the verifier, could both have signed the message. So it's not clear who actually had ownership because the same key is owned by both parties. So this is something that's very, very, very uh, relevant, interesting. So only with asymmetric cryptography, we can actually do um, this signing. And this is very, very interesting. If you wanna see some practical applications, you can go to my Twitter. So go to my Twitter, my handle is at Julian Hosp. And what you will see in my little status on the left side is actually my public key. Um, and the way I generated this is with a service called Keybase.io. You can do this for free if you want to. You can also connect with me on there. Keybase allows you to cryptographically verify social media profiles, gives you a public key. Obviously, you have the private key. And then people can send you messages and encrypt them with your public key. And you're the only one to decrypt them. But another thing you can do, if you have to verify that this is really you, and obviously as a business owner and a public figure, I have to do this on a regular basis, I can then go and I can actually create signatures with my private key, verifying that this information really came from me and not from someone else. And this is very, very interesting. If you wanna try this out, go to my Twitter. You can follow me there, obviously, of course. You can get your own stuff at keybase.io. Very interesting to understand this. Now, before we dive in and look how these schemes work, let's ask ourselves first, and we do this first now, cryptanalysis. How could this stuff get hacked? Um, and now, obviously, the very first one, how this stuff could get hacked, is simply by cracking the cryptography. And this is something we discussed in all the individual cryptographic, uh, cryptographic algorithms that we have been discussing, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and Ripley curves, in the videos before. So just ref refer back to those. So this is quite straightforward. Um, the second one is something called collisions. And collisions means that the same signature could, or the, 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 the message that I'm be giving, and I'm gonna show you how this works, um, there's actually different signatures that could be derived from this. And this is very, very dangerous. It could also mean that the same signature could be derived from different messages. And these collisions can, may not occur. Now, just statistically speaking, obviously, they could occur, but they are so rare that we can completely neglect them. And this is something we're gonna be t discussing actually in the next episode in great detail when we talk about hashing and about collisions there. And you will see that the probability of having collisions in a good algorithm, and this exactly comes down to uh, integrity number three here, um, it's in, in those algorithms that we're discussing are negligible. So the important thing is never roll your own crypto, use crypto that has been tested and tested and tested and tested because, and we see this also in cryptocurrencies, some projects try to roll their own crypto and then they get stuck by having collisions or by having problems. So always try to stay away from such projects. It's very, very dangerous um, because that many times means that there might still be deeper problems that you haven't seen or that haven't been tested. Um, you will see all these algorithms, they have been used for decades. They've been tested and tested and tested. And so this is very important here to understand. But now there is an actual problem in cryptanalysis here that we need to understand. And that is understanding how the signing actually works is that I cannot, as a signer, I am not free to choose what I want to sign to prove something. This is very, very, very important. So let me explain this to you. If there's a message and someone tells me I need to pr produce a signature, so I get a signature, Let's call it S. And there's a signature S. I am not allowed to choose freely, not freely, the message. And this is something that's very, very difficult to understand because every once in a while, you see out there that someone says, I'm Satoshi Nakamoto from Bitcoin. Here, I can prove because I can generate a signature out of a message. And the trick how this works is that these people start with a signature and then they generate the message from it. So they go the other way around. Does that make sense? 
This way, sorry, I need to actually I need to draw the arrow the other way. Going from a signature to the message can be easy to, to verify. So this is very, very easy to verify. But going from the message to the signature is really hard unless you actually know the private key. So unless you know the private key, unless you know key private. And this is very, very important. And you can imagine it this way. Imagine if I come to you and I say, hey, you know what? I'm actually a really, 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 really good dart player. Really, really good. And I'm like world class. And then I throw the dart and I throw the dart and I hit exactly a little field on the right. Right? I don't hit it in the, in the bullseye. I hit it exactly in a small field on the right. And now I'm telling you and I say, you know, that's exactly where I wanted to hit. That's exactly the place. And you see how good I am? I exactly wanted to hit this place. Now, here's the thing. If I only tell you afterwards, it basically means I have the signature because this is where the arrow landed, but I didn't, but I, you cannot be sure that I actually wanted to hit it there. So what is the only way how to make it clear on where to hit it to? Well, it's very easy. Obviously, I could tell you up front, but then there's only one person that's there. And it's only you. So if another person would come and check, how would this person know that I actually wanted to hit the dart there? It's very easy. I mark the dart up front. So I go on the dart and I mark the dart. So there's always a couple of things that I need to be able to do in the signature thing. I need to mark the dart. In this case, mark the dart. Basically, where do I want to where do I want to bring it? And the other thing is is actually the target. Where am I hitting it to? And if both can hit together, then I'm winning. And so this is the key. This has to be set up front. And the only way this is set up front is by someone else choosing the message, not me going and saying, hey, listen, um, this is the message. I'm just putting it out. And this is what many times happens when <laughs> stuff seemingly gets hacked and people can prove that they are someone. But then the trick, the actual proper way to do this is by going and me giving you the message and you having to generate the, secret, uh, the signature of it. And this is what is the key thing. And many, many times this kind of gets overlooked in the crypto analysis and how to attack those things. So always be very careful if someone can generate a signature to a seemingly random message, but then doesn't manage to generate a signature, uh, the signature if you give that person the message. So this is very, 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 very important in this um, entire kind of um, scheme of things. So before we go into elliptic curves, let's do RSA really quick. We kind of discussed RSA a lot. RSA, um, the signature system is very, very easy. Uh, remember, at the end, all we, we under want to understand is that the message to the power of phi plus one equals the message log n. And so all we need to do is we need to have this number split up. And this number split up is always the decryption key uh, times an encryption key. And it doesn't matter which step I go first. Do I go the encryption step first or the decryption step first? I always end up at the message if I then go the other step, right? So if this is the entire stretch and this is phi plus one, then it doesn't matter if I go here first and this is D and then here is E or if I go E first and then D. I always end up at the same thing. If I use, if someone else uses D first, then it's basi basically, uh, sorry, if someone uses E first, then it's this person encrypts it. This is encrypting and then this is decrypting. If I sign first, then I use my private key first. So the signing just means I use the private key first and afterwards the public key. Always the same thing. Basically the way it works is someone else who wants me to get verified gives me a message and I use my private key and I generate a secret, uh, a signature key private, right? And so the proof is very simple. This person can then just use my public key, key pub, and needs to get the message. Very, very simple, very, very straightforward. If this confuses you, then just go back to looking into RSA. Should be very, very, very straightforward. One quick note here is that obviously 
the signing part is very computationally intensive because we need to do the square and multiply algorithm. So it's way more computer intensive than the symmetric encryption. But the trick here is, and that's something we covered a lot, is to use very small public keys. Small public keys. They are predefined many times so that the, at least this part is intensive, but this part then is easy computationally, if you understand it, uh, if you understand what I mean. So this is just as a quick side note here when we talk about um, RSA. Um, a lot of it is pretty much repetition here. This should be all very, very straightforward. I'm not going to go into details here. Um, if we kind of do a quick check, confidentiality, yes, I'm not revealing my private key. Is it authentic? Definitely. I can only have done this if I know the private key to the public key. Integrity, definitely. Ownership, surely, because I should be the only one who has um, the private key. So we are making sure that all those four key um, points have, um, are actually being um, applied. This is always important um, to understand in, in, in this entire thing. Let's go to the next one, and that's the digital signature algorithm, DSA. And this is actually something that's uh, based on Diffie-Hellman um, LGML scheme. Um, and we're not going to go too detailed in this right now, simply because you should just check back the video on Diffie-Hellman. It's exactly the uh, same concept, just again also a bit flipped around with uh, doing the, using the private key first than the public key. But I want to go into something that we need for elliptic curves. And that is um, the idea that I need this ephemeral key. Okay. And let me explain you how it works. Imagine I have this clock. And how the signing here works in DSA is you give me a starting point called M. And I need to tell you an endpoint that I can prove. It's an endpoint. And it becomes clear from this endpoint, uh, this is the signature, signature S that I know the amount of steps here. I know the amount of steps, which is basically my private key. And I need to be able to prove this to you. Obviously, you also know key pop. And by putting this into perspective, you understand this. Now, here is where there's the important part. I cannot do this without adding another key. Because if I don't add another key, and that's why we're going to get another signature called R, R is derived from K times alpha, the generator point. We need to do this because if, I, if you give me another message, let's say you give me this message, N, and then my point is going to be here. So let's call this S1 and this is S2. What you could do is you could actually calculate my private key from the, seeing the difference of S1 and S2 because it is on this cyclic group. So what I need to do is I need to have this ephemeral key, which is a temporary key that I constantly change. Every time I make a signature, I need to change this key, right? K needs to be changed every single time. Needs to be changed every single time. This is very important, as you will see in elliptic curve cryptography. Even large companies like Sony make mistakes there. And this is something that uh, I'll show you when we discuss this on elliptic curves. Um, we'll not go too much into detail into DSA. First of all, it's very straightforward. Um, and it is pretty much similar to elliptic curve. Just here, we're using the discrete logarithm problem. And on elliptic curve, we use um, the elliptic curve. So formulas and everything, very, very similar. You will understand it when we're now talking about elliptic curves. One quick thing, um, obviously, because we have K here, we get two signatures, R and S. This is also going to be the same in elliptic curves. But and that's also a massive thing. These are twice the bit length. Twice the bit length. The bit length. Compared to the keys. So if we have a key that's 2048 bits, if that's the key, then that means, in this case, we have 4,096 bits for the signatures. And this is a lot. This is a lot, a lot of data. So I just want to kind of um, yeah, keep this in uh, mind here. So this is digital signature algorithm. 
And now we're gonna go away from, so this is based on the discrete logarithm problem, but now we're gonna go, and this is actually where we're gonna discuss, and we need some of these ideas. We're gonna be talking about elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. ECDSA. Great. Now, remember, a couple of things to remember. Here we're talking about coordinates. It's very different, not points. Quite key. And I think the key that's also very easy is the key private um, times an alpha point equals key public. Right? I think very straightforward. So let's talk about the signature generation. So let's talk about signature signature generation. The reason why this is important to understand is because all of the cryptocurrencies pretty much are based on uh, the ECDSA and it's very, very relevant to understand how transactions work. And this is the fundamental to all this. So this is the, the kind of trick here and this is what we really um, need to understand. Uh, signature generation, just like in DSA before, we're gonna get two signatures because we have um, this ephemeral key. So the first signature is R and um, R is actually very straightforward. It's this um, ephemeral key times the generator point, alpha, and um, it actually gives us, if we discuss large capital R, and lowercase r, it's just the x-coordinate. Important, k, secret, and needs to get changed every time. Otherwise, I have the same problem as before. Remember, the, the, the curve is nothing else than a cyclic group. And in the cyclic group, otherwise, I could subtract the signatures from each other if k doesn't change, and I could calculate someone's private key. We're going to be discussing this also at the end. So this is something that's very, very important. Uh, secret changed every time, and I need to use a random number generator to get k. Large number, 2 to the uh, two, uh, 256 bits. Very, very important. Great. And then we have the second signature, s. And um, S needs to basically prove, prove that I actually hit the target. So that's important. Needs to prove that I hit the target. So me throwing the darts. So let's define a couple of things. So R, very straightforward. I have this ephemeral key called K. Um, it's secret. I multiplied with the generator point and I get the x-coordinate, which is gonna be lowercase r. This is signature. S, let's define a couple of things. Uh, we get m, which is a message, and this message is hashed. We're gonna discuss this in the next video. What does this mean? Many times this is also, be, also called z. We just stay with m just for simplicity's sake, but if you ever see this in other uh, cryptographic um, papers, z many times means it's the hashed message. Now we get a function, and important, the message has to come not from the person signing. This is the key. The other person has to give this person the message. There has to be some outside force that's unpredictable for the signer. That's really, really important. Uh, now we have u. Uh, u equals the message m over the signature. Okay? So... Let's stay. Let's keep this quite uh, straightforward. Um, so S is the signature, and now we get another factor, and that's V, and V equals one signature R. Remember, R is derived from K over S. And so now we have something that I'm just going to write down, and you will just have to follow me because what I'm trying to prove is that you give me message. The message. The message is just a point on the curve, and that I can give you another point, and with this other point, I can prove that I know the private key without you knowing what my private key is. So how are we gonna do this? Very straightforward. We have u times the generator point plus v times k public, and that has to equal the ephemeral key times alpha. Now, remember, the public key, obviously, and alpha are publicly known, right? So let's just mark those green so that we know these are publicly known. This is very straightforward. 
Um, what we see from here is k is not publicly known. Obviously, that's uh, very, very important. Um, v is something we need to kind of figure out because v is r over s and u equals m over s. So this is kind of there and it would be good to find a u and a v so that I can get this other point. And remember, um, especially u is something I cannot directly influence because u comes from another person. We can see this from the m up there, right? So let's mark this blue maybe because here I have the message. So I cannot directly influence that. So I need to find a v that's directly in relationship to my public key and the V is R and S, if you can understand, if you can see this. So let's make, mark this yellow. So here I have R and S. So I need to find R and S that is in direct relation to my public key that satisfies a U again into another key number that I have, which is the ephemeral key that's private out there. So let's do some uh, reformulation so that um, this becomes a bit clearer. Um, what we are basically now doing is we write U times alpha, so that stays plus v, and now we split up the public key and we write that this is k private, k private, times um, the generator point, alpha, and that equals k times alpha. So, that's this. so we have alpha all the time. So what we can just do now is we could scratch away alpha and what it leaves us with that u plus v times the private key equals k. Very, very straightforward. So now you see already a couple of things. If you don't know the private key, right? So let's mark this one red again so that it becomes clear. So if you don't know the private key, I need to test, 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 test to find values because again, the U is something that I can influence. You gave me U. So I need to find a V and a K that fit together with your U that you are giving me. So this is now where it gets very, very tricky. Um, and so this only works if I know the private key. If I know the private key, it gets very, very easy. If I don't know it, I, it's very mathematically intensive and it's actually impossible. So let's do some substitutions. Let's substitute u, put m over s, because that's just from derived from above. Let's substitute v, that's r over s times key private, and uh, that equals k. So what I can do now is I can just put this into brackets and I write m, plus r times k private over s equals k. Very straightforward. So again, I see that, well, the message is something you're giving me. r is something that I can calculate from k, but it only works if I know the private key and I need to calculate s. So let's kind of just reformulate all that. We get kind of s, so we do m plus r times k private equals k times s. So we just bring the s to the other side. Now let's divide the entire thing by s. And then we have s equals, uh, by k, we have s equals m plus r times the private key over the femoral key k. And so it's very, very straightforward. How can I calculate the s? Well, the s is very easy to calculate by you giving me, so this is something that you're giving me, what color did I use, blue? So I get the blue, which is the message. Um, I can calculate the signature, uh, the, uh, the other, so K, I can calculate. Um, R, I can make public because it's impossible to back calculate it. This is I only know. And the little R, I can calculate publicly. So, but I can only do all this if I actually know the private key and I know, um, the ephemeral key, because otherwise it's not possible to calculate an S. And it's the same as in the digital signature algorithm, the entire flow. Um, the entire stuff works because you're giving me an M that I cannot predict. And I'm the person who actually knows the private key. And we're just doing mathematically reformulation. Now, remember, before we go into verifying the signature, because this is going to be relevant. So obviously there's an S and an R coming out, right? So this is one signature and the other. Let's look first at what happens. Why do I need uh, K? So let's do this first. Why do I need K? Um, and this is just basically coming from reformulating a lot of the things. Um, so if we look at this line here again, so we're looking at this line here, right? 
I remove this so to make it clear. So basically what we have is we have k times s equals m plus r times the private key. So now it gets very, very tricky. Um, if, <laughs> if you want to calculate the private key, then the way you would just do this is you take k times s minus m, so I take m to the other side, divided by r equals the private key. And so now it starts getting very straightforward because if the ephemeral key gets known, then I can calculate r. And s is something that I could calculate both of those, actually, I could calculate r. So r comes from k, especially if it's the same key. And then I can calculate s as well here. And from that, I can calculate the private key. And the way this works is exactly the same way as described here. If I always use the same one, then I could just subtract one key, uh, one signature from the other signature, and then I know what's going to be the private key at the end. So I always need to use a different k, and this k is, has to stay private. So I need to use a different k, and the k has to stay private. Otherwise, I can subtract the signatures from each other, subtract the signatures, because otherwise I can calculate the private key. So it has to be secret and changed. And this is a massive mistake that Sony PlayStation 3 made in their games. They use the same private key, uh, the same ephemeral key for every game. So someone just had to buy two games, and they could just subtract the signatures, and, well, they knew that the difference was going to be the ephemeral key, and that way it was very easy to calculate R, calculate S, and uh, then they had the private key that Sony used. My goodness, right? Um, interesting how this then works. Awesome. So now I uh, get from someone, I get R and S. And the only way they could have calculated this is by having the private key and having K. So let's talk about verification now. This is actually very straightforward. And verification is quite easy. We have U, which is the message over one signature. And we have V, which is R over one signature. And now it gets very simple. This is something we defined on the top, that U times the alpha point plus v times the public key. Remember, the public key has to be in there. We just split up the public key and the private key times the alpha point has to be, in this case, actually r. And remember, r is just x, uh, is, the, is, the, um, is the x coordinate. A little case is the x coordinate. And in this case, r is k times alpha. Remember, this is k private times alpha, and these are the entire things. So if someone can give me the values for u, and u is basically the message, the two signatures, and then the x coordinate, they obviously can tell me exactly on this circle, if I give them a random starting point, which is the message, and they're giving me an endpoint here, which in this case is a little r, they obviously must have known in between the factors how to get there. And part of this factor has to be the private key without revealing it. Because otherwise, they wouldn't have known the number of steps. And this is only shown here through basic mathematics, but it's very, very, very important and very relevant to understand how this works. Obviously, again, remember, if the message here is not voluntary, well, then I have a second factor, and I could just have any kind of public key here that I know, because I can see, for example, Satoshi's public key, and I can come up with a message with the generator point that's going to generate an x value for me. So it is very important that u becomes random, because this is basically the first step. So here is the first step. and this one is predefined, and then I need to know how far, how much further do I have to walk. And this is only possible by having the private key. I hope this makes sense. If you like this stuff, let me know in the comments below. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. This is gonna, be, this is intense, I understand it. And it involves a lot of math, cyclic group basic knowledge, but now we're kind of covering all this. We're gonna be discussing hashing algorithms 
in the next episode. And uh, if you do understand this, give me a thumbs up. Please let me know and give yourself a pat on the back because this is really, really some detailed, heavy stuff. And it shows that you really understand those 10 episodes. If you don't want to miss anything, then click the subscribe button, click the bell button. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next episodes. Yours truly, Julian. Thank you.